To many, the Arctic Circle is a desolate landscape, cold and unforgiving. But even in the most extreme isolation, there is life. Caribou, Arctic foxes, walruses, and more call this harsh environment home. But there is one creature that rules them all. The mighty polar bear. With a keen sense of smell, a swipe force of over 1,800 pounds, and a bite force of more than 1,200, the polar bear is a formidable and powerful creature, the largest land carnivore in the world, and this white landscape is its hunting ground. It's little wonder, then, that any who dare to challenge its dominion are often met with violence, and sometimes, tragically, this can include humans. At just 17 years old, Horatio Chapel had a bleeding passion for studying medicine. The young scientist dedicated his time to the prestigious Eton College, where he worked to fulfill his dreams of becoming a doctor. When he wasn't studying, Horatio volunteered at a treatment center that specialized in spinal cord injuries and diseases, and he also enjoyed traveling with like-minded intellectuals. In July of 2011, Horatio, along with 80 other university students, began their expedition toward the Norwegian archipelago of Svalbard. Organized by the British Schools Exploring Society, the trip was expected to extend over a month, giving the group plenty of time to explore the vast Arctic landscape. Situated north of Norway and adjacent to the North Pole, the Svalbard Islands are described as an Arctic fairy tale. From mid-April to late August, the sun doesn't set, creating 24 hours of daylight and making it wildly popular for those who thrive in freezing weather. This dramatic wilderness offers some of the most spectacular glaciers, ice fields, barren tundras, and assortments of wildlife. This includes the king of the Arctic. In fact, with 60% of Svalbard covered in ice, it's home to more polar bears than humans. The group of expeditionists arrived in Svalbard on July 23rd. Midway through the month-long trip, Horatio hiked to the Von Post Glacier with 10 other students and two instructors. They were cautious, and with good reason. The area they were in was known for polar bear activity, and so the group set up a string of trip wires that triggered alarms and flares when activated. On August 4th, the bunch camped overnight on a snow bridge alongside the glacier. In the early hours of the following day, at around 7.30 a.m., Horatio was the first to exit his tent to begin his morning. Horatio didn't even have time to fully stand up before a giant mass of white fur hit him like a freight train. As a 550-pound polar bear tore through the teenager's skin, Horatio desperately screamed for help, but the bear was merciless and efficient. His cries were cut short when the beast tore into Horatio's skull and eventually delivered a fatal wound to his neck. The emaciated and likely starving animal wasn't through, though. Desperate for food, it continued its rampage, savagely injuring four other members of the group. Seventeen-year-old Maninder Kaur watched these events unfold, wondering how the trip of a lifetime turned into terror in just a week. She saw Horatio's lifeless body fall to the ground, carelessly tossed aside by this apex predator. Seconds later, she watched her friend, 16-year-old Patrick Flanders, become the bear's next victim. Thankfully, Patrick would be more fortunate, though he would later undergo an operation to remove several of the bear's teeth from his skull. Amidst the chaos, the group's 29-year-old instructor, Michael Reed, took hold of the only weapon in the camp, his second World War-era Mauser 98K, and aimed it at the bear carefully to prevent shooting any of the young students. But once he pulled the trigger, the weapon failed to fire. Michael attempted to chamber multiple rounds, but the rifle continued to stall. As he worked to get his gun to fire, he yelled at the other group members to shoot flares in the hopes of warding off the bear. But in his struggle, Michael attracted the bear's attention, and the animal charged toward him. The bear closed the distance between them at incredible speed. It threw Michael to the ground, and before he'd even had time to process, he felt the bear's hot breath on his head and a nearly unbearable pressure as its canines threatened to puncture his skull. Desperate, Michael attempted to gouge the bear's eyes, but was unsuccessful. Group leader, Andrew Ruck, saw the attack and began throwing rocks at the bear. Andrew had been horribly mauled himself, but his efforts worked. Michael was able to grab the rifle again and reload it. Desperately praying for it to fire, he pulled the trigger one last time. This time, the gun went off. A deafening report pierced the air and the bear dropped to the ground. Its rampage finally ended. It's unclear what exactly led to this horrific attack, but Horatio's parents, Olivia and David Chapel, believe it was entirely preventable. In the weeks leading up to the trip, Olivia expressed concern about polar bear attacks, and they were given a risk assessment document. They were told that Horatio would be equipped with a pen flare and a tripwire system would be in place surrounding the camp. However, after an inquest into Horatio's death, it was discovered there weren't enough pen flares needed to frighten approaching bears, only the trip leaders carried them. Additionally, the parents were assured of the tripwire's efficacy, but weren't told that they often fail. It would also be revealed that there was a shortage of stakes to fully complete the tripwire, as well as mines that needed to be situated around the perimeter. As a result, the tripwire failed to engage. 
though the tripwire wouldn't have been an issue if the British School's Exploring Society opted for an overnight watch or guard dog as they were generously offered before their stay. Another preventative measure failed the group that horrifying morning. The leaders were one rifle short. Training was implemented for the rifle, but each member was only given four shots to practice, with basic instruction on handling, making the leaders unfamiliar with the rifle's safety feature. Michael Reed unknowingly had the safety engaged as he attempted to load the gun, preventing him from firing successfully under intense pressure. Although this wouldn't have saved Horatio since he was already killed before anyone was aware, it could have prevented Michael's near-death attack and the critical injuries of three other explorers. Though it's clear that more efficient safety measures could have been enforced to save Horatio's life, it's widely understood that when entering the home of these creatures, there is risk. But this is precisely what excited 48-year-old Matt Dyer as he set out on his adventure to the remote Torngat Mountains National Park. He was warned about the dangers of polar bears, but he couldn't help but think he'd be lucky if he saw one. Nicknamed the Place of Spirits, the Torngat Mountains are an Inuit homeland with rich history and a treasury of spirits and traditions, a place where nature and deep culture connect. Located in the Labrador Peninsula, this range encompasses 2.4 million acres of mountainous terrain. The park is a harbor for wildlife, including predators like black bears, wolf packs, and yes, even polar bears. But this didn't deter Matt's naturalist heart. It intrigued him. Accompanied by a group of hikers, he had already stayed a full night camping in the park, and all was well. On the morning of July 22, 2013, the group noticed a mother polar bear and her cub wandering in their area. Entranced by the creature's power and beauty, Matt couldn't help but be struck by the cuddly appearance of the cub, a stark contrast to its beast of a mother. Matt likely felt lucky to have seen not one, but two polar bears on his trip. But the trip wasn't over yet. Later that very afternoon, another polar bear crept into the area around their campsite. Matt saw the bear from a distance and watched as it struck its nose upward, sampling the air. It dawned on Matt that the bear was picking up the group's scent. Just then, the bear clearly began to focus its attention on them. The trip leader, Rich Gross, used a flare gun to attempt to ward off the bear, but it seemed content to wait right where it was, even drifting in and out of sleep. Despite its ominous hovering, Matt didn't want it to leave. He would have preferred it to be a bit more afraid of humans, but he was fascinated by the creature. He had read some Inuit poetry, and he knew that the polar bear was a god to them, sacred, just as the land was. In a way, this was something Matt understood. The bear stayed put as the group cooked and ate their dinner. When it was time for shut-eye, Matt glanced up at the ridge again, and the bear still hadn't moved. He began cycling through all of the worst-case scenarios and listed their safety measures in his head. The guides rigged an electric fence around the perimeter of the campsite to deter bears, but Matt wondered how something so flimsy could discourage a bear as large as this one. Matt was reassured that if he touched it, the shock would blow him out of his shoes. That certainly seemed powerful enough. Still, Matt struggled to fall asleep, but finally did, with thoughts of the bear plaguing his dreams. A few hours later, on July 23rd, Matt awoke to go to the bathroom. Stepping out of his tent, he looked up to the ridge. The bear was gone. Relieved, he crawled back into his bed and let himself be lulled back to sleep by the taps of a gently falling rain. Later in the night, he awoke again, this time to rustling in the campsite. He turned over from his stomach, and his eyes were met with two thick, towering shadows outside of his tent. He knew immediately that they were the legs of a hovering polar bear. As he screamed that there was a bear in the campsite, the creature tackled Matt and began clawing at him through the thin fabric. He attempted to cover his head, but that only crushed his hands. He felt as the bear's massive jaws stretched across his skull, felt its teeth pressing into his flesh. Holding Matt's head firmly in its mouth, the bear began running toward the ocean, perhaps mistaking Matt for a seal. Through tears in the tense fabric, Matt could feel the bear's fur prickling his skin. Its hot breath carried the overpowering stench of dead fish, seeming to thicken the air with every exhale. The sound of his own neck and skull bones crunching alarmed Matt. Amazingly, he had the presence of mind to feel grateful that nature was so kind as to make the body numb in its final moments. Matt's entire life had been spent fishing and harvesting from the ocean. To him, it seemed fitting that he would go out in a similar way. He felt a wave of cool air hit his body and he knew they were getting closer to the ocean. Suddenly, he heard the swoosh of a flare gun and a flash of light lit up the dark sky. His body hit the beach rocks, but he was too broken to move. All he could feel was a gelatinous goop that covered his body. But the danger hadn't left. Though it had likely been startled away, he heard the bear's footsteps as it walked back, closer and closer. Matt played dead, though it seemed that soon, he wouldn't have to pretend. Suddenly, another flare lit up the sky and the bear's steps retreated, this time continuing to recede into the distance. 
After firing the flares, Rich waited until the polar bear was out of sight. He and two other men ran toward Matt to find his eyes sliding from side to side, and he was still breathing. They carried him to camp where Dr. Rick Eisenberg tended to his wounds. A call for assistance was made and Marilyn Franklin, an exercise physiologist, stood guard on a rock with a flare gun cocked in her hands. Fortunately, the doctor managed to stabilize Matt and at 8 a.m. he was flown by helicopter to the Montreal hospital. He miraculously survived but with a cracked jaw, several broken vertebrae, severe lacerations to his skull and neck, a collapsed lung, and a broken larynx. He awoke the next day to see his wife Jeannie standing over him. She later recounted that Matt growled at her when she asked what happened. It was his way of saying that he was attacked by a bear. Because his larynx was shattered, he was unable to speak for weeks. In order to communicate, he was given paper and a pen. Pressing on Matt's mind was just one question. Where are we going next year? Matt lived to tell the horrifying tale, and his raspy voice is a lingering reminder of his near-fatal attack. But he's expressed numerous times that he has no complaints, and that every day is a good day to be alive. Sadly, though, Horatio Chapel doesn't have the opportunity to tell his story. Though polar bear attacks are extremely rare, the bears are still entirely unpredictable due to the lack of human interaction. Furthermore, the rise in global temperatures has caused the Arctic sea ice to rapidly decline and polar bears are spending more time on land, traveling through more populated areas. As a result, the number of bear attacks on humans has increased over the years. Between 2010 and 2014, there were 15 polar bear attacks, the greatest number ever recorded in a four-year period. Though one may not be able to keep polar bears from starvation, it's clear from these two cases that safety measures need to be a top priority while in the home of such unpredictable, deadly creatures. If you ever happen to visit the Arctic Circle, always remember that even in those vast stretches of desolate land, you are not alone.